Welcome to our channel. Today's story is titled, When Family Interference Ruins a Perfect Dinner. In this episode, we'll dive into a dramatic family gathering where a meticulously organized dinner turns into chaos due to some unexpected interference. I'm known in the family to be a control freak about preparing food. In fact, in my family, there are two dinners in the year that all members come, all 30 people. And before I took over, all dinners were extremely late. There was always some problem with seasoning or poor preparations. I'm organized and for every meal, I have a spreadsheet with everything I need to make a huge scale dinner. At first, they didn't respect it. Still, after seeing that my method was useful, everyone joined in and allowed me to be the head of the organization. Since then, dinners have been ready on time and everyone praises and repeats the dish. Not very common. Takes one to two days to prepare meals. I don't ask them to help me because I know I'm serious with organization. But if the person wants to, I ask them to respect the process. Another fact, my mother was a cook for one year and my sister-in-law is studying gastronomy. The situation, Sunday was the half-yearly dinner and I was the head as usual, would help me, my sister-in-law, mother, aunt, and uncle. This would be sister-in-law's first family dinner and she offered to help. During the preparation, my mother started to do several things wrong. And every time I said something, she said something like, stay calm, a wrong thing will not lead to anything. The problem is that she did so much wrong, skipping so many necessary steps in the food that most things I had to redo or give it a second look. She continued to help even though I said it wasn't necessary. Finally, I broke down when I just commented something about the steps with my sister-in-law and she corrected me. I was gonna comment, but my mother said, I think you better cool off in the pool and let those with experience sort it out. I accepted, grabbed a glass of wine, took the spreadsheet with me, and spent the whole day in the pool ignoring when asked to return. So, dinner was late, poorly seasoned, undercooked, and no one had a second dish. My mother later said I ruined dinner and humiliated our family in front of relatives in revenge. I shouldn't take that seriously because it was just a silly family joke. By the way, I love making these dinners. And yes, my mother's and sister-in-law's behavior is common. Am I the idiot? Edit. Examples of what she did wrong. She put too much salt on one of the meats, which was inedible. There had to be 10 of something for the food and she cut it in half because it was too much. It wasn't. Also, she started to make rice very early and we used the pan first for other food and the rice was last because it was the biggest and heaviest pan. My spreadsheet basically has the amounts and how long each cooking ingredient goes. I pointed out that when they got the quantities wrong, too much or too little, or when they start making food that's for a long time before or after. Not the idiot. It's one of the more annoying things when someone wants you to take responsibility for a project but insists that you do it in their style. It's especially irritating if your methods are your coping mechanisms and they systematically take away your coping mechanisms while demanding that you continue. And that's exactly what your mom did to you. I'm petty enough to love that you took the spreadsheet with you, too. I'm sitting here giggling, thinking about you in the pool like, you got this, right? Sure you do. Singing, carry on my wayward mom. I'm chilling in the pool as you told me to. Problem? Anyone who says there's a problem is an idiot. I would go low contact with my family after this level of disrespect, but maybe OP has a different idea of things. When people try to sabotage your work and then act like you're the problem, you got to draw boundaries and hold firm. Exactly. And how's this sister-in-law supposed to be a pro when it's her first dinner? I think the mom kicked OP out of the kitchen because she was trying to impress her new daughter-in-law. Then when it went wrong, she blamed OP instead of taking responsibility. So I have think that mom was low-key bullying OP to impress her new guest. A wrong thing will not lead to anything. What? It leads to all sorts of things. I can only imagine how expensive that wasted food for 30 freaking people was. Mom was embarrassed by the control freak style and wanted to chill, but she also wanted the structure and skill and outcome of having the person there who does all the stuff well. She can't have both, and she was embarrassed by not having it work out. She doesn't seem used to the concept of follow through. Next time, tell people you don't want help in the future. Tell them you're happy to cook but if you're cooking, you're doing it alone. Otherwise, everyone else can bring their own dish. I'm 29 female, a university professor slash researcher. My research focuses on maternity, law, and society. More recently, I've been diving deeper into how one of the repercussions of the child-free movement is the segregation of mothers. My family obviously knows what I do. My sister, 26, is getting married and is choosing to do a child-free wedding. Fine enough. She announced her choice to the family a few weeks ago. I said nothing. This weekend, a few cousins and close family members and I went out to brunch. 
My sister, out of the blue, asked me what my thoughts are about her child-free wedding. I said it was not the moment nor the place to talk about it. It was her wedding and my studies are from a much broader point of view, not from an individual perspective. Nevertheless, she insists. She says she won't be upset, and now a few others want to hear what I have to say. Okay then. So, I explained that from my research, I found that child-free community events like birthdays and weddings have a bigger impact on mothers. How child-free events often burden the mother, the ones expected to care for the child, to stay away from them, excluding not just children, but women from participating in the social life of the community they're a part of. So, how does this idea of having a day that's all yours, expecting your community to celebrate and support you, while excluding important members of any community, children, come from an individualist worldview while maintaining your expectations over your community? I did highlight again that my studies are not focused on one individual, but on the societal impacts of a changing dynamic in communities. I was more articulate than this, since I didn't have a word limit and answered a few questions that arose. However, my sister was quiet after that, and as soon as I noticed, I changed the subject and everyone moved on to other topics. Well, yesterday, my sister called me to tell me I was very rude to say what I said, and that she was upset with me. I've been thinking about it, and I'm conflicted. I know it could cause problems, so I refused to answer the first time, but she insisted and said that it would be fine. So, I don't know. Am I the idiot? Not the idiot. Was she fishing for a debate or an argument? She got the answer she asked for, knowing very well about what you research. Very well said, by the way. I've never seen child-free events from that perspective. You did everything right when giving your thoughts after being deliberately asked for them. I'm not sure what she expected, unless it was to validate her having a child-free wedding. It's weird that she would ask and reassure you she won't be upset, and then call you rude. You not only warned her, but gave her the information in a very professional manner. I wouldn't have been upset if it were me. I would go ahead with my child-free wedding, but it would give me food for thought. Also, thank you. I appreciate this input on the societal aspect of child-free events. It's an angle I've never thought of before, and it's interesting. Your broad themes and conclusions make total sense. I can absolutely see how that would happen. Not limited to weddings, but I've seen this happen in one friend group, which really sucked for the mom in question. She was lonely, isolated, and doing an unfair share of parenting. Your position clearly not only has merit, but also has support garnered from a body of social science research. So, I wouldn't just dismiss it as unimportant or untrue. Certainly, it wasn't rude for you to share it. I, 29 female, just got married to Tom, 32 male, three weeks ago. I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with him. We just returned from our honeymoon in Japan a week later, and I got the wedding photos. My sister was a photographer since she has a business and wanted to gift us all the photos and videos. One of my bridesmaids, Hannah, 29 female, dad passed suddenly, in a freak accident before the wedding. She has a necklace he bought her a few years ago, and she wanted to wear it on our wedding day, something she asked for on that day. Unfortunately, it didn't go with her dress at all, way too loud and long, and I thought it detracted from her dress. However, I didn't see this as a huge hill to die on, since I've read about editing wedding photos online, and that it's a way for everyone to be happy. So, she wore it in the photos and I asked my sister if she could do me a solid and edit two versions of the photo, one copy with the necklace in it for Hannah, and one without the necklace in it for me. So, I ended up having that photo printed and put up in the dining room of me and all my bridesmaids. Tom and I threw a barbecue to thank everyone again for coming to the wedding. It was all going well, until Hannah saw the edited photo without the necklace framed in on my wall. I explained and told her that I thought it was a nice way to compromise since I didn't say it didn't go with the outfit at the wedding. She wasn't happy and said that the necklace meant a lot to her, and it was rude to have it edited out. I apologized, but pointed out that we gave her the photos where she was wearing a necklace and that I wanted my photo with my original vision on my wall. There are photos of her where she's wearing the necklace. It was just this one photo of all my bridesmaids and me in front of our venue that I had edited. All of the bridesmaids' dresses were handmade by me to match my theme, and as a nice memento and part of their thanks for being in my bridal party. I would have designed hers differently if I knew she wanted to wear this necklace. She left pretty quickly after that, and has refused to answer my calls or messages of me trying to apologize. Was this an idiot move? She still got to wear the necklace to the wedding, and has photos of her in it also. But I wanted the outfits I made for my bridesmaids to be on show, not her dad's necklace. No idiots here. There's nothing wrong with you having an edited copy of the photo, but it was a little soon for your friend. Your friend's feelings are still raw. Felt like a jab to her. 
It wasn't. I know you know that. The other bridesmaids probably knew that, and your friend probably does too. But emotions are overwhelming. She just needs some time to go through grieving her father first. It was too soon, and that's not really anyone's fault. I'm sorry I wasn't as sensitive as I could have been. I got so lost in my own joy that I didn't stop thinking about how much you're grieving. I hope you can forgive me. Would you like to talk about your dad? Sometimes apologizing doesn't mean you've done something wrong. It's an acknowledgement that someone has been hurt and their emotions are all over the place. If it's an important friendship, swallowing pride and reaching out can go a long way. Weird scenario, but for the last two months, I, 28 female, and my husband, 31, lived on my sister-in-law's property. We have an RV parked beside our house, and we're using her electricity to run power. We have all of our meals with her, her husband, and her kids, and we also take showers indoors and do laundry. It is helping us out dramatically because we're able to save money for our home purchase. We couldn't save while we were in our rental. Now the agreement is that I do house chores, sweeping, mopping, dishes, caring for our dogs, their laundry if I feel like it, and alternating cooking days, helping with grocery shopping, roughly $600 a month because we all lead together, and pay her $150 for water and electric we're using. So around $750 a month, plus all our housework is done by me. My husband does all the yard work, mowing, weed whacking, insect spraying, garbage runs, and driveway maintenance, as it's dirt and gets ruts. I'm currently 26 weeks pregnant as well. The point is, we do a lot. Sister-in-law, her husband, and her kids hardly ever lift a finger with us being here. Anyways, I'm currently not working. My husband owns his own business and has gone 40 to 50 hours a week and makes more than enough to provide all we need here, plus saving a significant amount for a house. He doesn't want me working while pregnant. I have hypertension, so I left my job three months ago. Well, lately, my sister-in-law's been sending me job alert after job alert, easily eight to 10 plus a day. She's been dropping hints constantly. Every time we go anywhere, she'll be like, these guys are hiring, I can grab you an app. I always say no. I do not need to work right now as I'm contributing well beyond my means already and my husband doesn't want me working right now. So she drops it, but then continues to send me the alerts. Yesterday, I was kind of fed up because sister-in-law asked me to do a lot more yesterday and I was just exhausted. So I was cleaning, doing all their laundry and scrubbing walls because they had a party planned. And she sent over an alert for a cleaning position and I lost it. I responded with, okay, I will get a job, but that means you'll have no one to clean your dirty underwear and scrub your walls for you and I will not be doing anything but my portion of the chores around here. She responded, I'm just trying to help. There's no need to be nasty. My husband is on my side. Am I the idiot? Edit. We have talked about it. I thought the same thing, her being fed up with our arrangement. But my sister-in-law has clarified that she wants us here and doesn't even want us to buy a house to the point of her talking about converting her barn into an apartment for us and making big plans for it without actually getting a yes from us. She says this is her way of helping, sending me job alerts because she feels that two people need a job because she's resentful of her husband for not working. Not the idiot. The last line is what this is all about. So her hubby is just sitting on his butt. Oh, she has a lot of anger. You guys need to move even if it's to a fan camp situation that has hookups. What does she expect to happen when you give birth? This situation is going to get worse. I'm not even talking about the job alerts. This isn't healthy. You guys need to get out of there. Of course sister-in-law wants you there. She'll lose her indentured servant if you leave. You've been there for two months and you already pay for a good chunk of their food, do most or all of their chores, pay your utilities, etc. This is ridiculous. They're using you to help them with their finances and housework. You have a high-risk pregnancy. None of this is good for you. Exactly. OP, for $750 a month, you can rent a spot for your RV, likely with extra accommodations that benefit you instead of sister-in-law without the headache of dogs, cats, kids, secondhand smoke, and her lazy but husband. Look after the little one and your own well-being, mental and physical. You're not the idiot. I kind of feel sorry for sister-in-law. It sounds like she's projecting and maybe even mentally struggling, but you can be supportive from afar. My wife has a young teen daughter from her first marriage. She calls me by my first name as she has a very present and active dad. My wife and I also have a toddler daughter and an infant son. Originally, my daughter was calling me daddy, but recently she's been calling me by my first name. I let it go for a bit, but after a few months, it wasn't ending. I know it's innocent and she's only doing it because her sister is. I don't make a big deal out of it. For example, if she says, can I please have some juice, Justin? I'll respond, daddy'll get you some juice. I've gently told her before that I'm dad or daddy. Her sister calls me by my first name because she already has a dad. 
I'm not offended by this at all. I get it's normal. I just want to correct it now before it becomes a habit and it never ends, especially as we have a younger child who will soon learn how to talk. My wife thinks I'm overreacting and should just let her call me whatever she wishes. She claims if our kids called her by her first name, she wouldn't care, but they never have. So it's easy to say, I'm not on a power trip. I just think it's okay to want to be called dad. As long as I'm gently correcting her and not making a big deal, it shouldn't matter. The other night, my daughter asked for something using my first name. I said, dad will get it. And she corrected herself saying, oh yes, please daddy. My wife rolled her eyes and said I had broken her spirit. Was I wrong to gently correct her for this? It's completely innocent. I know someone else who had their own child and two older stepkids. Little ones are too young to understand familiar relationships fully. And she's likely just copying her big sister. Just gently correct her. Not the idiot. Your kid is just copying her big sister. She's not a teenager. She's a confused little kid. Your wife should call you daddy in her presence so she knows. Your wife is an idiot. I get that it doesn't bother her, but it clearly bothers you. And I think out of respect for you, she should be encouraging your daughter to call you dad, not Justin. There are many ways to break a person's spirit, but reminding them gently to call you dad is not one of them. Why doesn't your wife have your back? How would she feel if the child started calling her by her first name instead of mommy? I bet she'd be hurt. If you enjoyed the story, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more intriguing family tales. Don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay updated with our latest content. Welcome to the private conversation, a mother's secret on our 10th anniversary. This is a story about betrayal and hidden motives revealed on a couple's milestone celebration. Brooke's 10th wedding anniversary turns into a shocking revelation when her mother asks to speak to her husband. Hello guys, I'm here to tell you the story of my ex-husband, but let me get the introductions out. I am using fake names because, well, I don't want to be accidentally recognized. My name is Brooke, and the main people in the story are Sean, my husband, Camilla, my mother, and Melanie, who is Sean's childhood friend. Watch out for some drama, though. Sean isn't my husband anymore, and Melody turned out to be a homewrecker. Sean and I actually met through an uncle of mine named Andy. He was my mum's brother and a very reputable man in my city. It was through him that I met Sean. I was fresh out of college and Sean was employed at a company that my uncle's friend owned. We met at a party and quickly became friends. He seemed very curious about me when he first met me. He said, Are you related to Andy by any chance? You look familiar, but I know he doesn't have a daughter. I have checked before. You are right. I'm not Andy's daughter, but I am related to him. He's my mum's brother. Oh, so you are the lucky girl who will get all of Andy's wealth. Gosh, I am so jealous of you. We have been dying to meet you, actually. Back then, I thought that his comment was somewhat weird and inappropriate, but I overlooked it thinking that it may have slipped out by mistake. I laughed it off and pretended like it wasn't a big deal. Yes, most people knew about my impending inheritance from Andy. He was unmarried and had no children, so he had willed it to me. I was staying close to him to learn everything from him. I had a job but still helped around his estate. So when Sean mentioned knowing about my inheritance, it didn't strike me as odd. I should have been more careful, guys. I was young and fresh out of a bad breakup. Sean was actually a very respected man who was loved by the whole community near us. So I was also easily swayed by his sweet talk. The only problem I had with him was his childhood friend, Melanie. She was very rude to me and often interrupted our dates. When I talked to Sean about it, he said, Melanie is like that, Brooke. You know, she's my childhood best friend. We also work together, so we are super close. I understand that, Sean, but she is super rude to me. I think she likes you or something. It makes me super uncomfortable. Please tell her to stop interrupting our dates and being rude to me. Don't be so harsh on her. Brooke, she's single and lonely. She just wants to hang out with us. I can't change her behavior, but I will talk to her about it. Well, he never did because Melanie continued to be a pain in my butts. Sometimes she would get out of her way to be sweet to me, but most of the time she made fun of me and insulted me. Sean always told me to adjust with her. Guys, I tried, but Melanie hated me. It became much more apparent when me and Sean got married. Melanie said, just because you married him, that doesn't mean he is yours. I am and always will be his first priority. He'll always choose me over you. Melanie, I'm tired of being nice to you. If you're so determined to hate me, I will not put in the effort anymore. And you know what? I am Sean's wife, so I'll be his first priority from now on. 
Oh, we will see about that, Brooke. You better not get your hopes up. I'm saying this for your own good. Enjoy the marriage while it lasts. I was pissed at Melanie for saying these things. Sean and I were supposed to be madly in love. I was supposed to be his first priority and I would be. That's what I always thought. Well, I was wrong. As soon as we got married, Sean started to spend a lot of time with Melanie. They were always hanging out together and never let me join in. I insisted and said, Hey, Sean, we go out today? I feel bored at home. We can have a date night like before we married. It'll be perfect. I'll pass Brooke. I'll be going out with Melanie. Don't wait for me. I'll have dinner with her. But it's been so long since we've had a date. Sean, we've been on two dates in the last three months. At least take me along with you. How can you be so selfish, Brooke? You're at the house. I can see you all the time. Melanie is alone and doesn't have anyone. She needs me more. I can't bring you along. She feels uncomfortable because of your hostility towards her. Yes, that's what my husband had to say about me. Readers, despite all the red flags, I stayed married to him for ten freaking years. I don't know why I did it. By the end of two years, Sean was already checked out of the marriage. I begged and pleaded to go marriage counseling. I didn't want to be divorced, but Sean never listened. By the end of ten years, I was slowly starting to realize that Sean might be playing me. So I decided to check his text with Melanie one day. I tried my best to get his passcode and snapped through his messages. This is what I found. I hate keeping our relationship secret, Sean. I hate Brooke and seeing you with her breaks me. How long do we have to put up with this act? Don't worry, Melanie. It's only a matter of time. Brooke's uncle is very sick. Won't be alive for a long time. Once he dies, most of his assets will go to Brooke. That man loves my wife like his own daughter. But what does it have to do with us, Sean? I don't like to be your mistress. I want to marry you and have a family with you. I want that too, dear Melanie. I have plans for Brooke. I'm going to put my hands on her inheritance. Once she gets the money, I'll ask for a divorce. I'll say that she's a horrible wife and abuses me mentally. Everyone will believe me because they think I'm a good man. In the divorce, I'll get half of it. We'll have a great life with the money. Oh my God. This is your plan? I doubted you for nothing. You really think about our future a lot. I hope Brooke's uncle passed away soon. That which will lose everything at one go. Oh, he'll be hilarious. I can act like the childhood sweetheart who heals your broken heart. People call us the ultimate couple. The way they talked about me made my blood boil. I thought that finding proof of their cheating would break me inside. But it just made me super angry. I had my doubts about the two of them for a while. But Sean was manipulating me into thinking that I'm crazy. All these texts between them made me feel victorious. I have had enough of being manipulated and treated like crap. I was done. I quickly took screenshots of their texts and saved them on my phone. I then deleted those screenshots so that Sean doesn't suspect anything. Then I went straight to my mom for help. I knew that I didn't have the mental stability or patience to execute a solid plan for revenge. I needed my mom. I went to her place and showed her everything. She was shocked and said, I can't believe this. Brooke, your husband really is a vile and disgusting person. I thought he was a good guy, but he's a freaking snake. I know, mom. Everyone thinks he's such a great guy. At this point, I'm not even sure anyone would be on my side if I leave him. You know what? You think he's cheating on you and using you for money, right? I'll bait him into revealing his true face. That way you can get rid of him and everyone will know what a piece of crap he is. That is a great idea, mom. He thinks he can get away with manipulating me. He has it all wrong. I will show him who he has messed with. He will regret this. That's my girl. Let's just go over the plan and make sure we don't miss anything. You will get this opportunity just once. We have to be careful. So me and Mum went through all the details of our plan. I knew for a fact that Sean was cheating on me and using me for money, but I couldn't prove it in any way. But now I finally have a solid plan to catch him in the act. I decided to execute my plan at our 10th wedding anniversary. We had already planned a big celebration and everyone, including Melanie, would be there. It was my perfect chance to ruin them in front of everyone. The day of the anniversary came and we were all having a good time. Sean was trying to sneak off with Melanie a couple of times, but someone or the other was interrupting him. Honestly, it was hilarious to see how hard he was trying to make a good impression on people by entertaining everyone. In a few minutes, everything will come crashing down around him. Just a little before we were due to cut our cake, my mom came up to Sean and said, Hey, Sean, I see that you're busy, but I was wondering if you could spare a few minutes for me. I really need to attend to the guests here. Can this wait, Camilla? 
I'm afraid I need to talk to you right now. It'll only take five minutes. Brooke can stay here and entertain the guests. All right, then let's go. I'm curious to know what you want to say. Sean and my mum left to go to the balcony. I knew for a fact that my mum was recording the conversation. It would be fun to see his reaction when mum baits him. I patiently waited while mingling with the guests. My friends had been briefed about the situation so they knew what was coming. In a matter of minutes, Sean and my mum were back. When Sean was back, he looked really pissed. My mum also looked grim, but shot me a smirk when everyone was busy asking Sean what was wrong. Even Melanie said, Sean, why do you look so upset? Did Camilla say something to you? Today's your anniversary. You shouldn't be upset. Tell me what happens. Yeah, Melanie, I'm super upset. Everyone, I have an announcement to make. There will be no celebration today. The wedding and marriage is over. I'll be divorcing Brooke. What do you mean, Sean? I'm confused. We're having our 10th anniversary and you're asking for a divorce? That's ridiculous. Don't try to act naive, Brooke. You know I've been unhappy with you for a while now. You've been mooching off me and using me for money. I am done with your antics. I know that you have no inheritance and plan to live off on my income. I won't allow that. We are over. Oh my God. I had a feeling that Brooke is with you for money. I was honestly hoping that she turns out to be a good person. How could you do this, Brooke? You have been taking advantage of Sean. I'll support Sean in his decision. I've had my doubts for a while. Hearing the accusations at me really made me laugh out loud. Sean and Melanie's words had already shocked everyone. People who knew me had no doubts that something didn't add up. However, most of their friends and colleagues were eyeing me with disgust. Everyone around me looked super confused when I started to laugh. Even Sean and Melanie were eyeing me with suspicion. Sean said, Why the hell are you laughing, Brooke? This is ridiculous. Look at her, everyone. Look how shameless she is. Instead of defending herself or crying to have her husband back, she is laughing. This just shows how horrible Brooke truly is. Your words have made me laugh, Melanie. You and Sean do make a great team, to be honest. And why the hell would I cry to have my cheating and gold-digging husband back? I'm not that stupid. How dare you level such insane accusations against me? Everyone here knows how respectable I am. I work at a prestigious firm and have a great yes, yes. Why are you trying to ruin Sean's reputation? You're such a witch, Brooke. You want revenge against Sean for divorcing you? Oh, Melanie, I don't want revenge against Sean for trying to divorce me. In fact, I will happily give him a divorce if he asks for one. But I'll definitely take revenge for what the two of you have done to me. You think you are a reputable person, Sean? Then how will you explain these? At that point, I took my phone and started a beautiful slideshow that I had prepared for our anniversary. Yes, you guessed it right. I went with the classic presentation style to explore their affair. It had screenshots and images from security cameras in the house. The images shocked everyone. The things written in the screenshots of their texts angered them as well. Sean's boss also looked pissed because it was against company policy to date someone from the office. Sean and Brooke hurriedly started to accuse me of faking the texts and making them look bad. They were desperately trying to get everyone to listen to them. But I had some extra ammo up my sleeve. They said, all these are lies, people. Please don't believe this. Melanie and I are very good friends. She can't stand how close we are, so she's trying to spoil our images. Yes, all these screenshots are fake. She's definitely hired someone to fake them and make us look bad. Brooke, why are you trying to destroy our reputation? You are a monster. Oh, really? Melanie and Sean, you two think these screenshots are fake? Well, people, if any of you have these doubts in mind, you need to listen to Sean's own words. Then I signaled my mom to take out her phone and play the recording. Sean looked extremely pale and was just about to stop my mom from playing the recording. But my mom acted fast and played it before he could do anything. The recording played. Sean, there is something that I need to tell you about Brooke. I thought that it was important that you know. What is it, Camilla? Tell me now. You're wasting my time. It's about Brooke's inheritance from her uncle. You should have said that before. Is he dead already? When will we get the money? Well, that's the thing, Sean. My brother has changed his will. He will be leaving everything to another cousin. Brooke is pretty stable, so he's not giving her any money. What? Brooke is not getting the big inheritance? You can't be serious. You can't just tell me that I spent 10 years with that witch for nothing. How can you call my daughter a witch, Sean? She is your wife. You need to show her some respect. Don't you love her? Why would I love her, Camilla? Your daughter is a good-for-nothing woman. The only reason I married her was because I knew she had a huge inheritance coming. 
If I had known that Brooke won't ever be witch, I would have married Melanie long back. So, it is true your affair with Melanie. You've been cheating on Brooke. How could you do this to her? She loved you. Well, I don't care if she loves me. She's useless to me now. You know what, Camilla? I will show Brooke her place today. I'll tell everyone that I'm divorcing her. That she is a gold digger and has made my life hell. Your daughter deserves to be treated like the crap she is. Mom stopped the recording and let everyone come to terms with what they had just heard. I won't lie, guys. I did feel very hurt and embarrassed by the way Sean spoke about me. It felt that I was useless and incapable of being loved. But I held strong. I could see that Melanie and Sean were looking very pale and frightened. That was enough to remind me of something. I might not be successful in love, but I am not a pushover. I can make people suffer consequences for hurting me. After the recording was played, there was not much I had to do anyway. I had already started a chain reaction where everyone turned on Sean and Melanie. You see, we do live in an orthodox community where our daughter is taken very, very seriously. So things were not looking very good for them right now. People were beating them for their behavior and all of them stood in support for me. My friends added fuel to the fire by relaying all the way Sean neglected me in the marriage. It was the perfect day for me, the best anniversary I had with Sean, and it would be my last because I had one more surprise waiting for him. I said, now that everyone knows the truth, there's just one more thing I need to do. Sean, you don't have to file for divorce. I already did it. Here are the papers. You need to contact me through my lawyer. No, no, listen to me. We can work this out. You know, everyone here would want you to give me a second chance. We can't break marriages that easily. Melanie was just a small mistake. Trying to save your face, Sean. You think if you convince Brooke to forgive you, people will forget and forget everything, too. That will never happen, Sean. You had done wrong by my daughter. Now you will see what happens when you break your vows. There's no use begging, Sean. Your mistress, Melanie, won't be very pleased with it. My decision is final. We are getting a divorce. And just to be clear, I'm going to take half of your house in the divorce. Good luck trying to buy me out. Saying that, my mom and I left the venue. Sean was surrounded by an angry mob of people. Melanie started to scream at him for trying to abandon her and stay married to me. It was a whole shit show and we wanted no part of it. Two of my friends had left early to pack my stuff and send it to my mom's house. My lawyer assured me that I would get half of the house, so I didn't need to stay there anymore. I moved in with my mom and prepared for a divorce battle. Months passed and I was finally able to get a divorce from Sean. In our state, couples can get divorced after being separated for six months. Thankfully, we never had kids, so we didn't worry about that. Sean had to split the house with me since it was bought after our marriage. He was forced to sell his share because his savings were low after the house purchase. He had no way of buying me out. I actually bought the house from him with the money my mom gave me. I returned the money after I got my inheritance from my uncle. The inheritance did come free, but not before me and Sean got divorced. With great care, we were able to keep my uncle alive for a while longer. It was another slap in Sean's face since he wanted my uncle gone soon. Let's talk about Melanie next. Well, well, Sean did try to get back with me after I filed for divorce. He wanted to preserve what little image was left of him. Melanie hated it and proceeded to break up with him. Sean didn't care because they had other things to worry about. Shortly after we got divorced, their boss fired them from work. He was actually a good friend of my uncle and understood the situation. He kept Sean employed till the divorce so that he can't claim alimony from me. So Sean and Melanie have broken up and I have been fired from their jobs. Last I checked, Sean was planning to move to another state since no one liked him here anymore. Thanks for watching The Private Conversation, a mother's secret on our 10th anniversary. If you found this story gripping, please like, share, and subscribe for more real-life dramas. Welcome back to channel, where we delve into the deepest corners of relationships, uncovering tales of love, loss, and betrayal. Today's episode is a poignant reminder that even in the sanctity of home, hearts can shatter and trust can crumble. Our story is titled, Shocking Betrayals, Cheating Spouses Exposed in Heartbreaking Tales. So, grab a tissue and prepare your heart for the emotional journey ahead. Hey folks, welcome back to my channel, Relationship Haven. In today's story, OP found out his wife cheated on him with a guy that is nothing like OP. The guy is broke, has a restraining order against him, and still lives with his parents at 42 years old. Now, she claims she wants to reconcile, in today's second story, OP found out his wife cheated on him with her adopted brother. Now, let's get into today's stories to find out what happened. 
I'm contemplating divorcing my wife of 16 years and mother to my four-year-old son. In January, she revealed she had been having an emotional affair which began six months earlier. She had just broken things off. I was in shock hearing this. I thought we had had a loving relationship and a wonderful life together. Things weren't perfect, but overall there was a lot to be happy about. We both had rewarding careers, a child we completely adored, and a beautiful home. I saw us as best friends, and there was no one I would have rather spent time with. However, it's fair to say that the degree of intimacy in our relationship waned several years prior to our son's birth, starting with a long bout of infertility and continuing after we conceived our son through IVF. Infertility and being a new parent took its toll. We struggled for nine months raising a baby who suffered from severe colic. One time, our baby was screaming so loud that a neighbor called the police to do a welfare check. It was rough. The colic subsided, but bedtime still seemed never-ending. It was only very recently that our son moved out of our bedroom to start sleeping in his own room. I don't think the word exhaustion does justice to the feelings we've mutually experienced. In my mind, there were challenges of parenthood, ones we shared equally. When my wife expressed worry about the lack of intimacy in our life, I knew on the one hand that she was right, though I didn't know how to change things. On the other hand, it seemed like the demands of being a new parent offered a reasonable explanation. I also believed that intimacy was something that could or would ebb and flow, more the former in those early trying years. My wife didn't feel the same way. I think she saw our lack of intimacy as a failing in our relationship and was deeply unhappy about it, more so than she was willing to admit. Then she met her affair partner and was somehow awakened to the true depth of this void in her life. We started seeing a couple's therapist in the fall. Unbeknownst to me, her affair was playing out in parallel. I felt a deep distrust after learning about my wife's emotional affair and small details nagged at me. Was this exclusively an emotional affair or did more happen? What was the extent of their relationship and how meaningful was it to her? Over the course of several months, I uncovered many details that weren't really volunteered, or rather, I was able to dig up information through my own investigative efforts. For example, data recovery, monitor emails, checking browser history and so on. With each new detail came a new revelation and I learned that much more had happened than I was first led to believe. My wife went out of town on three overnight trips during the past fall and winter. Each time I gave her my encouragement. She was leaving to work on writing projects or go snowshoeing with friends and I believed these were activities to be nourished. I stayed home and took care of our son. Later, I learned that she met up with her affair partner on every single trip. I learned that they had exchanged sexually explicit pictures and videos. Unfortunately, I saw some of this material too. I learned that they had sex on many occasions. They told each other, I love you. At some point, they envisioned a future together, but needed to be patient while biding their time. However, in January, my wife decided to break it off with her affair partner. Things did not go well. She was on the receiving end of abusive and threatening text messages. My wife became very controlling with regard to her affair partner. I was urged to block his phone number and email address and Instagram account so that he could not try to contact me. I was made to feel that he was a mentally unstable individual, an unpredictable person that I and we should be afraid of. I started sleeping in my son's room, which is on the main floor. I wanted to be sure I would hear if he tried to break in. He would drive by in the middle of the night and throw bags of things on our lawn. The police were called. Unfortunately, that's not where things ended. We continued to go to therapy, which shifted its focus to the affair. However, my wife was unable and unwilling to completely sever contact with her affair partner. They continued to text. He bought her a Valentine's Day gift. She bought him a birthday present. They continued to see each other. They were still intimate with one another. One day, I slipped my phone into our car, turned the GPS on and watched her drive to his house and stay there for two hours. It's hard to grapple with all the things I've dealt with, and it's hard to reconcile how my wife could allow herself to be in such a toxic relationship. Her affair partner is the polar opposite of me. He's unstable, broke, and lives with his parents. He's 42 years old. His ex-partner has a protection order against him, and he has only limited and supervised access to his own children. I don't know what to say. I love or loved my wife. I love our family. This is not what I wanted. OP, here are my thoughts on the situation. You are aware of what has happened. You need to gather evidence and talk with a lawyer about your options. You do realize that as your wayward wife continues this facade, you're putting your own child's safety and well-being at risk. She's checked out of this marriage, which you're hanging on to and using lies, deception and gaslighting as a way to keep you as a doormat. 
check your state laws as to reasons for divorce. If you live in a no-fault state, it may make things harder for you. If you do seek legal advice, have any visitation on the part of the wayward wife stipulate no visitors of the opposite sex while having visitation since you already know the affair partner is mentally unstable. Let's see what the comments had to say about this situation. Kranich said, I know that you deeply love your wife and I'm very sorry that you're in this situation, but you are no longer just together with her. You are responsible for your son now as well for his mental and physical well-being. Where do you think your son will be when your wife wants to see her affair partner while she has to look after your son because you're at work or somewhere else? She needs to learn that she destroyed the bond you once had, that all trust and respect is lost. Not that you have to fight for her. She walked out. She betrayed you. If she wants this marriage to survive, then she has to fight, not you. It is your job to show her that you no longer tolerate her affair, her disrespect and her selfish, entitled behavior. Build up a bed in your son's room and sleep there. Ignore her presence at home unless it is about the kid. Stop going to marriage counseling. That is good for nothing for as long as she lies. Tell her that you will not even shake her hands before she meets with a doctor and gets tested for STDs now and in three months. Then do the most important step. Go to a lawyer, prepare the divorce papers and serve her with divorce papers. Now let's get into today's second story. This is my first time posting, so please bear with me. This happened to me just a couple of days ago. Let me provide some background. I've been with my girlfriend for one year. She has two kids of her own. I myself have one. Our story starts way back in eighth grade. She was my first love. I moved to Los Angeles, which led to us separating and of course people move on. Throughout the years we kept in touch here and there. I always knew I loved her and would from time to time think about her. Last October I reached out to her and we began to reconnect. Shortly after we started dating. Last May we discovered she was pregnant. She is now five months along. Now to the present day. We now live together and have been preparing for the baby's arrival. Things had seemed to be going pretty well for the most part, but for the past couple of weeks I had noticed her acting very strange, especially in regard to her iPad, which is connected to her phone. So all photos, texts and calls are registered to it as a result of having it synced. She's a hairstylist, so she would leave it at work in her locker or in her car. About a week ago she asked me to watch the kids while she went out to work for a couple of hours. While at home I heard her iPad going off, so I went ahead and checked to see what it was. The messages she received were from her older adopted brother. He was adopted at a very early age by her father before she was even born, from my understanding. The messages began neutral, nothing out of the ordinary, until the really awful stuff started to show. The messages led into lots of sexting and nudes being sent from her to him. They also planned days to meet up when she wouldn't have the kids with her so that they could have sex. However, this is where it gets confusing. Throughout the text messages she made excuses as to why she couldn't have sex, but could only hang out, even though she was clearly scheduling days to see him. A few hours later she arrived home and I confronted her about the entire thing. Her response was that he took advantage of her a couple of years back while she was drunk, and from there it started to become a common consensual occurrence. She eventually put a stop to it, but recently it had started back up and she had been trying to get him to stop pursuing her by sexting him and cutting it short because she didn't want to lose her brother. She also stressed that they haven't had sex recently. She just saw him two weeks ago. It all sounded like bullshit to me so I packed up and left. I'm shocked. And now I've had doubts that the baby is even mine. Because I can't believe anything she says. A part of me wants to understand and even go back to her for the baby's sake. I don't know what to do at this point. I'd appreciate any advice. OP, here are my thoughts on the situation. You need to get a paternity test ASAP and then also let her parents know what happened so she doesn't go around spinning the narrative. You also need to contact a lawyer and get an STD test. I wish you the best of luck with your situation OP. Thanks for taking the time to listen to today's stories. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already done so, and comment below on what your thoughts are on today's stories. If there's a story you'd like to share with me about your own situation or someone else's, then please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care, everyone. Remember to subscribe to Heartstrings and Home for more captivating tales of love, loss, and redemption. Until next time, may your home be filled. Welcome back to the channel, dear listeners. Tonight, we delve into a tale of betrayal, deception, and ultimate justice with our story titled, My Wife and Her Secret Lover Plotted to Kill Me. But I turned the tables and exposed their devious plan. Gather close and listen well. For this story will take you on a journey filled with suspense, unexpected twists, and a shocking revelation that will leave you speechless. So, without further ado, let us begin.
Edgar grew up in a simple family of school teachers. They lived modestly, but his parents did their best to bring up their son well, to instill in him good qualities and habits. The only thing they could not give was financial well-being. But Edgar was able to achieve everything on his own. He tried his best, met the right people who steered him in the proper direction. And by his 40 years of age, Edgar was already the owner of a profitable business with an income of hundreds of thousands. Seven years ago, Edgar had the tragedy. His beloved wife and daughter died in a car accident. On that fateful autumn day, there was dense fog and the road was too slippery. The driver warned Edgar's wife that it was dangerous to drive out in such weather, but the woman insisted, as she had long promised to take her daughter to a children's performance. The driver had to agree, and everything ended up in a tragedy. A truck drove into the oncoming lane, the vehicle skidded, and the driver was unable to avoid a head-on collision. Edgar was deeply affected by the loss of his loved ones and decided that he would never be able to tie his life to someone else. The memories were too fresh and painful. So he lived alone with a Labrador, his lost daughter's pet. Kind and generous by nature, the man spent all his spare time doing charity work and helping homeless people and animals. But one day, a miracle happened in the businessman's life, and it brought him back to life. He couldn't believe it was possible. He met Chelsea, a young woman of 25, who was strikingly similar to his late wife. She was so enchanting that after meeting her, Edgar did not want to part with her. They met by chance. Chelsea was walking through the parking lot just at the moment when Edgar got out of his car. The girl was in high heels and accidentally twisted her ankle. The pain was so intense that she couldn't move. Let me take you to the emergency room, suggested Edgar, who immediately came up to the beauty. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll put ice on it at home and everything will be fine, smiled the woman. Edgar, of course, could not let her go and offered to give the stranger at least a ride home. On the way, they got to talking, and Edgar was surprised at how cheerful, confident, and sociable the young woman was. When they discussed pets, she sadly told him that her Labrador had died several years ago. She could hardly hold back her tears when she was talking about her dog, and Edgar realized that he had met not only a beautiful and clever woman who was very similar to his deceased wife, but also a sincere person with similar interests. Thinking that he was very lucky, he immediately asked her out. The first date was followed by a second, third, and soon Edgar and Chelsea were practically not partying. They went everywhere together, and it was not important where to meet, in expensive restaurants or small eateries, walking around the city, going to exhibitions, or shopping together for groceries. The affair was developing so rapidly that very soon Edgar introduced Chelsea to his friends as his bride. Only his friends and companions did not share his joy and did not understand how he could be so deeply attracted to the greedy, in their opinion, girl. They tried to warn Edgar not to make a mistake by marrying her. But the man explained these conversations as the envy of his friends, tired of their family life. Despite the disapproval of Edgar's entourage, the wedding took place, and after this, many have noticed how the man has changed. He became more open to communication, was always in a cheerful mood, and willingly visited friends, proudly boasting of his young wife. But time went on and soon Edgar began to notice his wife's strange and unpleasant behavior too. Chelsea became aloof, secretive, unkind, often avoiding intimacy with her husband under the guise of urgent matters. There was no longer that gleam in her eyes, which he had been so fascinated by when they first met. When she called someone or texted, she always went out into another room. One day Edgar even noticed his wife being rude to his Labrador and realized that a person who truly loved animals was unlikely to do that, and that meant only one thing. Chelsea had tricked him for some reason the first time they met. It was around this time that Edgar hired a new gardener upon his wife's request. Honey, I love roses so much. We have such a wonderful plot of land, a lot of space but no flowers, and the garden is kind of untended. She dreamily began a conversation once, trying to encourage her husband to changes. I want to plant bushes and plenty of roses. I want the house to be drowned in roses. Of course, my love, Everything will be just the way you want, agreed her husband without any suspicion. Thus, Spencer appeared in his house, and soon the owner began to notice how money and some valuable things began to disappear from the house little by little. Of course, these were small sums compared to his wealth, but Edgar, who had been used to knowing the value of money and controlling his spending since childhood, was not happy with such a state and he was not going to tolerate thievery in his own house. The last thing Edgar wanted to think was that Chelsea was involved in the disappearance of the money. But before the arrival of this woman in his house, such cases had never occurred. 
In addition, the relationship between his wife and the gardener seemed suspicious to him. While Spencer was working in the garden, Chelsea behaved with him in a reserved, business-like manner, as with the other staff, keeping the necessary distance. But as soon as they were in those places where they could not be seen from the windows, their style of communication changed abruptly, and they behaved as if they were old friends. Edgar was not ready to put up with being made a laughingstock and decided to gather evidence and reveal the strange couple. At first he thought about hiring a private detective, but then he gave up the idea. He could not believe that his wife was capable of such a thing, and it seemed humiliating to the man to involve a stranger in the case. The whole situation greatly disturbed Edgar, and one day he could still not stand it and shared with his best friend. You should check her out, maybe you should play a trick on her to expose her, suggested his friend. Edgar liked the idea and he decided to act. He staged an accident with his car, made sure that his wife was told about it urgently, and he spent a few days in a private hospital. After waiting a while he returned home and, in an atypically loud voice, told a concerned Chelsea about the state of his health. Darling, I'm lucky to be alive, but unfortunately my head injury is serious. The bump damaged my eardrums and I lost my hearing. From now on you should write me whatever you want to say, and from tomorrow I will start learning to read lips. I have already found a teacher, lied Edgar to his wife, who sighed heavily, showing how worried she was about him. Oh, how terrible it is. Why do you have to go through all this? Wailed Chelsea, smearing fake tears on her face. Of course Edgar heard everything, but from that day on the man had to be very careful not to give himself away, and to be able to listen freely to everything his wife talked about with the gardener. He quickly discovered that this Spencer was no gardener, but a long-time associate of his wife. They were lovers, and had long been deceiving wealthy men. Now their victim was to be Edgar. They carefully gathered all the information about his interests and habits. Chelsea even had to dye her hair to look more like his late wife. The woman was a master of the art of seduction, and could captivate absolutely any man. The swindlers set up everything so that Edgar would definitely pay attention to Chelsea, and then she turned on all her charm and skill. Having gained the trust, the criminals were going to poison the businessman, but fortunately his sudden deafness blunted their vigilance. The woman stopped hiding from her husband when she talked on the phone with her accomplice, but in front of strangers pretended to be a hospitable hostess so as not to give reasons for gossip. One day, Chelsea suggested that her husband go on a picnic together. The day before, Edgar had overheard his wife and the gardener discussing the murder plan in great detail, and he had prepared well for the event. Your favorite wine, dear, for good spirits, cheered Chelsea, holding out a glass of the poisoned drink to her husband. As his wife turned away, Edgar exchanged the glass for another and made a toast. I raised this glass to my wife Chelsea, who decided to poison me. The smile slowly slid from Chelsea's lips. The woman turned pale and began to shiver. Yes, my dear, I am not deaf, and I know everything. And rest assured, you and your lover will not escape punishment. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I didn't mean. Chelsea fell to her knees begging for forgiveness. But Edgar only looked at her coldly and waved his hand at someone. Immediately the police, who had been waiting in ambush the whole time, appeared and arrested Chelsea. Spencer was also arrested half an hour later. As it turned out, the international police had been looking for the couple for a long time, but never managed to catch them red-handed. Edgar immediately divorced the con artist and tried to erase all memories of her from his life. And that, dear listeners, is how I outsmarted those who sought to betray me. If you were captivated by this tale and crave more stories of suspense and triumph, be sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update. Share your thoughts and similar experiences in the comments below. Have you ever uncovered a secret that changed everything? Until next time, stay vigilant and remember, the truth, hello, everyone. Today, I have a story that is as heart-wrenching as it is shocking. It's about the complex dynamics of family relationships and the unexpected choices people make. This is, my mom's husband rejected my sister for coming out. I told her to stand up to him, and she did. Get ready for a tale that will keep you on the edge of your seat as we dive into the intricacies of love, acceptance, and standing up for what is right. So, sit back, relax, and let's dive into this captivating story. I, 22 female, have been raising my siblings since my mom abandoned us for another man seven years ago. So I was rather young when the life of five underage kids fell into my shoulders. My siblings are Emma, nearly adult, Jesse, young teen, and Jacob, tween. Anna, pre-tween, and Alexa, young child, are my half-siblings. 
But when my mom abandoned us again, I couldn't bring myself to leave them. It's a long story, so I won't get into detail. It's been very hard to take care of them. Honestly, I had to give up on so many things in my life so that I could give a better life to my siblings. I know how hard it is for them to be left alone without the support of their mom and dad. So, I did my best to ensure they won't lack anything. I tried to work multiple jobs so that they could join clubs they wanted and get them relatively good stuff so that their classmates won't make fun of them. I tried to be there for them when they needed me, regardless of how tired I was. I genuinely tried my best. For the last couple of years, I've worked as a dancer at a club to get money to send my older siblings to college. I'm ashamed of working there, but if that's what it takes for my siblings to have a decent life, I can put up with it. But here's the thing. Recently, Emma got into a relationship with one guy, 19. He's not the best, to be honest. He gives many red flags. I've tried to talk to Emma, but she didn't listen, so I thought maybe it would just be a short-lived relationship. But a week ago, Emma announced during dinner time that she was pregnant, and it made up her mind about keeping a baby. I've tried to talk to Emma about how it's not right and that she should concentrate on getting to college or anything that will help her achieve her dreams. But she said that she had made up her mind and that I won't change it no matter what. When I asked how she was planning to take care of the baby, she said I was a bit taken aback, but I told her I'm not going to do it, and if she wants to keep the baby, she has to figure something out on her own. I'm sorry, but I can't put myself through that roller coaster of caring for a baby when I've already gone through that five times. Emma got mad at me. She yelled at me and told me that it was my responsibility to take care of her and the rest of the family and how I had done it before and I could do it again. She said because I made good, dirty money, I can afford to have another baby and take care of it whilst she'll get her life in better condition than I made it for her. I repeated that I did my best and I don't want to take care of another baby, but she just called me the worst sister ever. All that made me rethink everything. So am I the idiot? I don't know. I feel like a horrible person. Not the idiot. Tell her categorically that your dirty money will not support her anymore. She can go ahead and earn good money and fend for herself and her child. Please do not give in. Her contempt for your livelihood should be the last straw. Her sense of entitlement shows that you've provided for her above and beyond just necessities. Stop now. She can fend for her judgmental butt. This is the right answer. She tried to make you feel guilty over the dirty money. That was a very low jab. If it's legal, it's not a dirty job. Considering your sacrifice to raise them, you have every right to think over yourself now. You don't want to go again for another 18 years. She wants the kids? Fine. But that's her business now. Do you want to play an adult game? Go get a job and find out by yourself how hard it is. Emma needs a serious wake-up call. You're right in what you said to her. Don't back down. Someday you need to start living your own life. You were younger than her when you became a parent. And to be completely blunt, throw her ungrateful, entitled idiot out of your home. I'm not sure if she legally can. Yet, once Emma's 18, she should be able to kick her out with no problem. Do not cave to your sister. She can go to the baby daddy for help if she wants to keep the child. Took two people to make that kid, and neither of them was you. You are not a horrible person. You took care of your siblings when most of them would have given them to anyone else. But you know your limit, and it's not fair to you that you keep being stretched thin to take care of everyone. My fiancé, 32 female, and I, 35 male, have been together for nearly five years. My fiancé is currently 26 weeks pregnant with our little boy. My fiancé has two little girls. The oldest, pre-tween female, is biologically my fiancé's daughter. And the youngest, female young child, is biologically my fiancé's niece, her sister's daughter. But my fiancé has special guardianship of her, so makes all legal and medical decisions. Important info. Both girls have the same last name as my fiancé. I love both these girls with my whole heart. I would do anything, literally, for them. We will get married in about a month, our five-year anniversary. We're currently in the process of me adopting the older girl and adding my name to the guardianship of the youngest. Unfortunately, we can't legally change her last name due to the legal issues surrounding the youngest case. My fiancé and I talked, and I suggested that the simplest answer was for me to change my last name to the same as my fiancé. I don't want to double-barrel my last name, as I feel this defeats the whole point. I want us to all share the same last name. This also means when our baby boy is born, he will be given my fiancé's by then mine as well last name. My parents have always been, in my opinion, obsessed with carrying on our family name so I knew this decision would upset them. I know it's harsh, but my little ones mean more to me than my parents' obsession. I had a sit-down talk with them. Mom was crying and Dad was angry. 
neither understood my decision. They want us to change both girls' names to my current last name. Apparently, that was the obvious decision. Changing my name will obviously disgrace our family. What will people think? I'll make my parents fodder for gossip. My fiancé did suggest using my current last name as the baby boy's first name. I didn't even suggest this to my parents. My last name is alright, but it would be a god-awful first name, and I'm not doing that to our son. My mom was demanding I talk sense into my fiancé. Our conversation ended with me telling them I'm not interested in their tears, drama, or their opinion, and I won't allow them to talk to my fiancé until they're less emotional. She's nearly six months pregnant, and the last thing she needs is my parents shouting at her for a decision I made. Am I the idiot for how I spoke to my parents? Am I the idiot for changing my last name when it means so much to them? Not the idiot. I just don't understand why this outdated patronymic tradition is such a big deal to some people. While I can understand your parents' disappointment, getting this emotional is irrational. They're asking you to have three people change their last name, even though you legally can't change one versus one person you, which is simpler. As long as you don't mind, they shouldn't mind. It's not the name that matters, it's the person. Carrying on the family name is a really stupid social norm. Everyone's situation is different. What a wonderful person you are to do this for your kids. And you're right. Your kids are more important than your parents' desire to have you keep your last name. My husband took my last name when we married. It's not uncommon. It's not shameful. No one cares that we did this. Your parents suck for painting this as some huge, insurmountable problem. It's literally got nothing to do with them. Next tell them if they keep up their tantrum, you will go low contact. I am a nearly adult male and the youngest in the family. I was adopted at the age of four. My biological mom was best friends with my adoptive mom, and she legally adopted me after my biological mom passed away. Any reference to my parents below refers to my adoptive parents. I have three older siblings. My parents covered their college tuition in full and then covered law and medical school for two of them. The other sibling didn't go to grad school. They also gave them a stipend to cover living expenses. I talked to my parents about college and what help I could expect. And surprisingly, they told me there wouldn't be any help because they didn't have any money left after they paid for my siblings. I wasn't expecting a similar level of support, but I was expecting some help. My mom told me that my bio mom didn't leave money for my college, so I'll be on my own. So I asked if this was really about money or if this was about me being adopted and not their real son. They were offended, but reassured me that they generally couldn't afford it after they purchased a condo for my sister earlier this year. And it takes a few years for their finances to recover. So it's just my bad luck that this has coincided with me going to college and there's nothing they can do now. I called them out and told them that I wasn't buying this explanation and that they wouldn't be doing this to me if I was their biological child. My dad reminded me that I'm acting in an entitled way and should instead learn that we don't always get what we want. He told me that most parents couldn't fund their children's college tuition, and I'm acting like I'm entitled to a tuition-free college when I'm not. But my point has been about being treated unfairly compared to my siblings. In the end, they told me they don't really need my permission or approval to support any of their kids and I just need to accept that this is their decision. I said in that case, they also need to accept that I believe I'm being treated differently because I'm adopted and their answers have not been convincing. They told me I was being an entitled brat. Now I fear that I may have overstepped and indeed maybe I am being an idiot. Not the idiot. Of course, kids are not entitled to their parents paying for college and condos, but I think you're entitled to the same treatment as your siblings. If they support one, they should support all. Your age is not a secret. So they knew college was coming up and they were making a choice. They helped out all their other kids with college, then bought their daughter a condo, then told you it's not your business what they do with their money. Then they call you an entitled brat. How are you supposed to feel? I'd feel left out if all of this is true. They're treating you differently and sure as heck it's because you're not their biological kid. Sorry, that sucks. OMG, they never plan to pay. Buying your sister a condo is a convenient excuse. If they plan to pay, they would have set aside that money. It's not like you going to college is a sudden surprise. I would literally bow to them every time I walked in the room and say, thank you so much for everything you've done for the orphan. They want two classes of people in their household, reminding them that it exists at every turn. Personally, I find this to be a ridiculous argument, but here we go. I got married recently, and for family pictures on my side, we decided to do just my mom and dad, divorced as both of their new partners came into my life as an adult. And to be honest, I can't stand either of them. My dad just assumed I wouldn't want his wife if she isn't family to me, 
and my mom knows full well that I'll never take a picture with her boyfriend after the things he said about me. Neither said a word about this. We got the pictures back recently, and my wife is furious because my dad had his hands on my mom's waist. I don't see why that's a bad thing. My wife said it's creating a false narrative that they were together. People would think it was weird, and our future kids would assume they were married at the time. I said it could be much worse. My mom could have been one of those crazy mothers-in-law. My dad could have had his typical grumpy face. I thought the pictures looked nice. My wife disagreed, but I thought we put it behind us. We had dinner recently with my dad and his wife, and my wife gave him a copy of the pictures. She pointed out his hands and asked him why he took it upon himself to stage the pictures and why he thought that was an appropriate picture. He said it just seemed like the natural place to place his hands. He told her to calm down, which made things worse, and she began getting an attitude. I intervened and said he didn't ruin the pictures and to leave him alone. I said it was such a minor thing and who cares, but I told him to stop laughing as my wife being upset isn't funny. My wife feels I betrayed her and that I'm not trying to see things from her point of view. Am I the idiot? OMG, false narrative? Dude, does she know your parents were married before it had you, right? Like they did used to be a thing. Who will go through the wedding pictures and nitpick it's something like a pose from the parents of one side of the family. It's just a good thing that your parents are capable of being able to act nicely together at a wedding. What does she want? Drama and cake throwing? I hope she's not usually like this or you're not going to have a happy marriage. Your wife is nuts. I'm so sorry. Your wife severely overestimates how interested your future kids will be in the wedding photos. Besides, what does she want instead? For them to be screaming at each other or looking like they wish the other person was on the other side of the world, so there'd be no question to any outside observer they weren't together. And what exactly does she want to be done about it now? If she doesn't drop it, let alone stop throwing around ridiculous overreactions like betrayal. Seriously, I don't hold out much hope that this marriage will last long enough for anyone to care about the photos. Apparently, father should have been attempting to strangle his ex because that would be closer to the truth. Your wife sounds like a bridezilla. I would have loved to have my parents get along. They wouldn't have stood next to each other in a picture, let alone allowed hands on each other. Your parents did something nice for you. She needs to drop it. This is such a strange thing to have an issue with. I'm a male teen, and this might sound dramatic, but bear with me. My mom was married before and had my half-sister, Mia, is now 27. She met my dad when Mia was seven and had my sister, Brooke. Brooke was born with disabilities that would require lifelong care and support. Mia hated that mom was married to dad and wanted nothing to do with Brooke. And they worried about who would take care of Brooke when they were gone so they had another kid, me, so she'd have a caregiver in the future. I've spent my whole life with this knowledge and being trained to put Brooke first and to be willing to take over her care once I'm needed. The pressure's even worse since Mia doesn't want anything to do with Brooke or me and always refuses to get any training for taking care of Brooke. I hate that my parents expected it out of us in the first place, but I hate being doomed. I'm facing a life of caring for my sister and needing to devote my life to her. But I'd feel bad getting married and having kids because she'll always need more care. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be in charge of her. But if I say no, she has nobody except to go into some sort of care facility and I know my parents have not planned for that so it would still fall on me. I've been lashing out at my parents more lately so they brought me to therapy and this is when I told them I hated them for having me. I told them they gave me a burden to carry my whole life before my mom gave me birth. My parents are mad at me and they think I'm selfish. They also think my feelings about caring for my sister make me cruel. Am I the idiot? Not the idiot. You are not responsible for your parents' children. You're a child yourself. They should have saved up for care and help for your sister. I stress again, this is not your responsibility at all. How people sacrifice the happiness of one child to be able to help another child and relieve their guilt is beyond me. Seriously, anyone that has another kid for the sole purpose of the younger kid taking care of an older sibling is trash. It is so beyond wrong, and they have some nerve calling OP selfish and cruel. I hope OP realizes they're just trying to guilt him into being their slave again. They had plenty of time to organize care for when they passed and save for it. Rather than being responsible, they chose to have another child. Responsibility for your sister is not something they're physically capable of transferring to any other person without a pay schedule. Call CPS. That's abuse. They can't force you to stay, especially when you're 18. I would talk to your therapist, teachers, or sympathetic relatives. You need to start building your plan to become independent when you turn 18. Your sister is not your responsibility, and putting that weight on you and telling you that's why they had you is abusive and terrible. Get out. It is your life, not hers, not theirs. 
If this story touched your heart, please give this video a thumbs up and share it with others who might need to hear it. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so you never miss a new story. We'd love to hear your thoughts and experiences in the comments below. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more.